You know, when I think about um, Easter, and again, when you soak on this whole past week, what was going on? Um, you know, you can lose touch with the fact that something dramatic and radical took place in the disciples' mindset. They literally came to the Last Supper thinking one thing, and they were totally blindsided by the events that were about to take place. You, you know, the last uh, Sunday before, uh, the last weekend before uh, the Lord's Supper was Palm Sunday. And on that occasion, uh, Jesus was celebrated. He was lauded. Uh, thousands came out to affirm him. And so the disciples were leaning into the thought that onward, upward, things are going to get better. This is awesome. And so when they came together for a dinner, they were not thinking that he's going to be crucified and going to die and all of our concepts are going to be shattered. They, they had a completely false paradigm. And to me, when I look at this story, it's written for us. I can't think about them as some archaic people. I think about me in this story. Who am I in this story? And we who know Jesus, we who have received his love, recognize that these disciples had spent three and a half years with him. They, they weren't the Pharisees. They weren't the religious people. They weren't just those who had rejected Jesus. They were the closest people to him. And yet they were without a clue. They were acluistic, okay? They didn't understand what was about to take place. And that alarms me. That concerns me because very often I'm thinking, I think I know what's going on. I think I know what's about to happen. I think I know what's going to take place. And when you read this story, you realize none of that is true. And it tests our motives. And what happens when you are blindsided by life, if you're responding to it properly, you're humbled. Everyone is humbled by life. You can be hardened by life. At some point, obviously, Raul talked about that hardening. But all of a sudden, there came an opportunity for him to make a decision, am I going to be hardened or humbled? And he chose humbled. And because of that, it set in motion a journey that he's still on, that I'm still on. We are all on a journey. And so when I think about even this weekend and getting up today, I'm grateful for the forgiveness of God in my life. I'm grateful uh, for the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that if there was no one else on this earth, he would have had to die for my sins. And so I can't compare myself to others and feel better. I have to recognize that it was my sin that put Jesus on the cross. And because of that, I am forgiven uh, because of his resurrection, because I've received him. Now I can walk in that liberty. But it takes, ultimately, us being honest. And today I want to encourage you to be honest about where you are with God. Where are you in relationship to him? I believe that uh, reality is our friend that there's something about reality that we can look at. And in this world where people, uh, I mean, there's so many opportunities for unreality, from our entertainment to relationships to people just presenting themselves with new concepts of what is real and what is not. Uh, it's, it's caused our whole culture to be totally deceived and then propagating that deception around the world. Here's a quote that I think is very profound. Dr. Dan Alander says this, Honesty is the commitment to see reality as it is. Without conscious distortion, minimization, or spiritualization, honesty begins by admitting we are deceived and that we would rather construct a false world than face the bright, searing light of truth. But honesty will always cost us something. It always costs us something to run to the light. Every time I, I share in a vulnerable way, whether it be with a crowd or individuals, every time I'm honest before just God, uh, it costs me something. Because in my weakness, suddenly he becomes strong in my life. Uh, whenever we're acknowledging what we're not, whenever we're acknowledging what we've missed, you never feel inherently stronger. You're not thinking, I am awesome, because you're coming to terms with really what has gone on. And that's what happened with the disciples. They were totally blindsided by the events of that Easter week. And they find themselves really shipwrecked, having believed they would be different people than they were. I want to read you one story that to me describes uh, kind of where the disciples were, where a religious mindset is that many of us can fall into, where we think, I'm okay. I've made some advances. I've made some changes. I'm okay. 
as if somehow we're still breathing uh, to go on autopilot, that somehow what has taken place, no matter how significant it's been, has transcended us to a place that we can just settle and accept it. Uh, I believe that from glory to glory, God's changing us, that God is trying to open our eyes and open our hearts to see brand new things today. That's why I'm breathing. I am believing today I'm going to see new things. When you hear this story, uh, you're going to see a whole a cross-section of viewpoints that people had. And one person understood who Jesus was in this story. In Luke chapter 7, I'm just going to read it to you. There's no slides. Then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. So one of the Pharisees, a religious person who is, is more religious than righteous, uh, who is going through the motions but doesn't have the relationship, invites Jesus to come to his house. And he went to the Pharisee's house, and he sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil and stood at his feet behind him. Behind him, she stood at his feet weeping, and she began to wash his feet with her tears. And again, these were sandaled, dirty feet, okay? Uh, and she washed his feet, the feet of Jesus, this woman, with her tears, and then wiped them with her head, with, with her head, her hair. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. Now when the Pharisee who had invited Jesus saw this, he spoke to himself, just said it in his heart. But Jesus knows our hearts. He knows our motive. He knows our thoughts. He thought in his heart, this woman, this man, rather, if he were a prophet, would know of what manner woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. This is the irony of life. We can come to Easter thinking, you know, I sure hope those sinners really hear from God today. <laughs> I really hope there are some people who are in the room that can really understand the importance of Easter, like I do. This is not... This is me up here as a guy who, I'll fight you to say I needed Jesus more than you did. Because <laughs> I know me. I don't know about you. I know me. And I know how much I need Jesus in my life. Today, not some kind of antiquated ancient statement. Today, I need Jesus in my life. I need him tomorrow in my life. So here's what happens. And Jesus answered and said to him, okay, this is amazing. This guy's thinking it, and Jesus is, is uh, answering him. Simon, I have something to say to you. Teacher, say it. You know, we think we're so ready. Like, <laughs> I came to Easter. I'm ready. Francis, just say it. <laughs> I'm completely ready for whatever you have to share. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed five, one owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they had nothing with which to pay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, you have rightly judged. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house, and you gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears. I mean, I just want to cry because... This is God the Son. There's a humble servant sitting on a throne in heaven. There's not this bully in heaven using his power to come down to earth. I'm going to show them what I'm like. This is God come to earth and identifying what impresses him. Not the little religious people that are flaunting how good they are. But this woman who had nothing going but knew it. I'll give you a hint. You don't have much going. <laughs> Just ask anyone who knows you. <laughs> Just take a deep look in the mirror. You've heard me say this. The more I know me, the less impressed I am. If, if you have gotten to know yourself and are thinking, wow, I am amazing. <laughs> I'll just ask you this question. How many of you would say, it is easy being you. Just being me is like, pff, just simple. I think us being our true self, who we are created to be, that's a full court press, guys. 
That's being conscious and humbled every given moment. And it's not God fixating on what I'm not. It's me learning to fixate on who God sees me to be. That's what he was doing with this woman. So what happens? But she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. She gave me, you gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore, I say to you, yeah, her sins, they're many. Do you know what? They're forgiven. For she has loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. I just would say to us today, if you have thought you've not been that bad, if you have thought, you know what, I'm a pretty good guy. I mean, Raul, sorry, Raul. Francis, he shares his testimony. Ouch, he really had problems. But I'm doing pretty good. Then perhaps you're the Pharisee in the story. How many want to be the Pharisee in the story? How many would rather be the woman kissing Jesus' feet? <laughs> I mean, we all, we all get to decide who we want to be in this story. That's who I want to be. And it's not, I don't have to pretend to be. It's like I have to, and then I have to pretend like I'm humbled by my life. No, no, I just have to wake up. I have to genuinely assess who I want to be. When I read the Word of God, it challenges my life. I don't read the Word of God and say, that's me, me totally me. I read it and go, Lord, I want to be that person. I'm going to be like you. Make me like you. So here's the story. I'm going to catch up then on the, the week before the crucifixion and the resurrection. I'm going to catch you up on some conversations that took place. Luke chapter 22, and Peter said to the Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Jesus said, I say to you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will utterly deny me three times that you know me. Now, this again is a body slam. These guys are not, he's not thinking what Jesus is thinking. What, what if, what, when he says, my thoughts, God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts and my ways are not your ways. That might give us a hint that we might not, in a knee-jerk way, thinking that my perspective is right. Because when I read the word, I find my perspective is being adjusted every page, every sentence. I am seeing God's perspective of my life. And it's not bad. If there's a good, loving, caring father who's got a better plan for my life than I could ever write the script. But his, his idea of success is different than my idea of success. His idea of me being a winner is different. Think of the cross. That was a winsome moment for the God of the universe, becoming sin for us. And yet, it's not the script we would write for ourselves. So we all have a universal need to realize that we are perhaps more wrong, more wrong than we know and that God is more right than we realize. Now, if you realizing you're more wrong than you know sounds like bad news, it means you're more attached to your perspective than God's perspective. Rather than defend, I'm not that bad, I'm not that bad, why don't you just turn yourself in? Right. <laughs> why don't you just run toward the light instead of trying to justify the darkness? Well, I mean, I'm not as bad as him, Lord, and I'm not as bad as her, Lord. And Those people in the Bible did not do well. Who am I in the Bible? I'm the guy who needed Jesus the most. I'm Peter saying, I'm going to do this, and then not doing it. So here are five lessons Easter teaches us. Number one, allow Jesus to challenge your wrong perspective. And if you don't know what that is, look again. <laughs> look again, because it's a constant mid-course correction. Walking is a constant mid-course correction. Life is a constant mid-course correction. I'm adjusting when the Bible says in Ephesians, I don't like this verse. We are by nature children of wrath. I don't like what, how many want to be a child? I just can't wait to be a child of wrath. That's my goal in life. <laughs> when God's talking about our nature, you know, we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. 
all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. That's our propensity. Now, we can deny it and reject it and then reject the best gift. Never open the best present you'll ever receive, which is everlasting life, forgiveness, healing. So when we get a glimpse of how wrong we are, how attached are we to being right? I want to give up my attachment to being right. This is one of the Caleb spots I wrote that I felt applied. One of the greatest illusions of this age or any age is the assumption that what I believe is almost always right, especially that I am usually more right than what someone else believes. This is what's happening. Turn the airwaves on. You know, People are just professing what they believe. And I don't mind people sharing their convictions, but there's so much condescension toward anyone else as if I've got the corner on the market. And what I have found in these troubling times, especially in our city uh, where we have a very diverse community and I have very close friends in every aspect of the community, I'm not picking sides. I'm empathizing with everyone involved in the challenges of life because that's, tr that's real. I believe that all of us can empathize with people who have had different backgrounds and struggles, who face different struggles and temptations every day. And that produces empathy and compassion, not judgment and a criticism of someone else. If you want to take comfort in rightness, then affirm what God knows is true, not what you think. No one has deceived me more than me. And yet, no one can dig me out of the deception if I harden my heart. There is great reassurance in agreeing with God's word and spirit. I read God's word and I listen to his spirit and then I can feel good because I'm agreeing with something that is eternal and true. And only an illusion of peace when I spend my life agreeing with myself. Agreeing with yourself is not a multitude of counsel and only leads to a multitude of mistakes. Agreeing with God's word always leads to rest and reassurance. Never presume you know better and you will live in peace and not regret. Another situation takes place. It's a universal condition. It's not just Peter. That Peter, no, Peter just had the big mouth. Peter was just the first guy to show how wrong he was. But look at this verse in Matthew 26. Even if I die, Peter said with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the same thing. I just want to make you feel included, okay, in this story. That all of us are here. No one at the cross was going, I knew it. No one knew it. The only person who knew what was going on was Jesus. And even then, he knew in part because he was part man. And, and he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He was suffering that separation from his father by becoming sin for us. And so the crowd is wrong, often. And we are part of that crowd. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 7, you can enter... God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad, and its gate is wide for many who choose that way. You know, I don't know if the commentary that just came out of uh, the Vatican this past week is true or not. I hope it's not. They, they have been denying it, but there was a commentary that the Pope had said he did not believe in hell, that he believed, in an interview he had said, that we just would cease to exist. Bad people would just cease to exist. And all I would say is, I believed that when I was an atheist, okay? So that's what I believed uh, when I didn't believe in God. Hey, eat, drink, be merry, tomorrow I die. Tell me something that gets my attention. That does not get my attention. I could care less. I could care less if I cease to exist. But if I'm responsible for my actions, and there are consequences for my actions, and that's why, you know, even in the death penalty debate, that's a valid debate. If you watch maybe some of the news where some of the kids who had that uh, former student go in and kill all the, you know, friends that they had. And some of them said, you know, I want him to spend his life thinking about what he did. That would be a better punishment than the death penalty. And again, I'm not here to discuss the issue. I'm just saying that there's a case to be made about someone thinking, taking responsibility for their actions for many years and thinking about what they did. And maybe they could be rejuvenated, as many of us are in the process of being. Such were some of you. I'm not the same guy as I was in college. I'm not the same guy who took advantage of people. I'm a different person. I don't want to be the same guy I was last year. I want to be a new person. And so... 
I believe that pleasure and pain provide incentive for us. Uh, we don't talk a lot about hell here, but I will tell you, if you read the Gospels, Jesus talked more about hell than heaven. Just Google it. Go home tonight, Google Jesus talking about hell, Jesus talking about heaven. And it, it's not going to be a fun Google. But uh, you'll be confronted with some reality. I, I just think I am healthily persuaded that there's consequences for my actions. You know, the fear of God's the beginning of the wisdom. The fear of Susie is the continuation of wisdom. <laughs> That's a good thing. And so I want pain at times to get my attention because pleasure will not do it. And we don't dwell on it here. In his presence is fullness of joy. But if I am blowing up my life, I want pain to catch up to me and slap me. Thank you. <laughs> so, second thought. Following the crowd provides a false comfort. Don't bow to peer pressure. Bow to God alone. You know, <laughs> throughout church history, study the Bible, study church history, Christians have always had to singularly stand up for what was right. Last year, 40,000 Christians around the world were martyred for their faith. Not blowing themselves up with bombs, but because they believed in Jesus and would not recant that reality, their lives were taken. And they estimate 40, 50 million have been martyred for their faith down through the centuries. Because it costs something to be a Christ follower. Don't find comfort by joining in. The crowd has been wrong as it was on the crucifixion, it is today. Continuing on, John chapter 13, Peter then said, Lord, why cannot I follow you now? And, and this is the sentence that we say, why can't I? Why can't, your kids will say that. Why can't I? Why can't I stay up later? Why can't I have ice cream? Why can't I punch him in the face? You know, why can't I? Why can't I? And that's what Adam and Eve said. Why can't I eat the, the fruit? Solomon, after the wisest man who ever lived, said at the end of his life, why can't I worship other gods? You know, why can't I? Paul said, why can't I, as a, as a guy coming out of the Pharisaical lifestyle, why, the things I want to do, I can't do. Why can't I do what I, what I know is right? And we have in our culture, you know, why can't I watch whatever I want to watch, say whatever I want? I can cuss if I want to. I can drink anything, smoke anything, shoot anything. I can do whatever I want to. I can sleep with whoever I want. I can, I can, why can't I? That was my, when I was suicidal, I was pregnant with why can't I? That's what drove me to the end of myself. All the why can't I's. Well, you're explaining to your kids, if you have them, there's good reason <laughs> why you can't. Because there are things that will hurt you, that will harm you, that will destroy you. So we, we put safety parameters. Now, we're not just trying to say don't. We're trying to replace the don'ts with the do. We're trying to give them, you know, find a healthy environment where you can grow and blossom relationally connected, worship God, be taught the word of God, become a healthy person, have a healthy future, you know, be a part of life, not stay away from bad, you know, be not overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. And yet we're coming to an hour that is incredibly deceptive. Think of, look at this verse, John 16. It's a terrifying verse. The hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. Now, now again, you can look at that verse and think about who are those people that would do that to me. When I look at that verse, I think, what am I doing that I think I'm offering service to God? Again, I'm not killing anyone at this point. I'm grateful for that. But what in my life am I thinking, I'm doing it for God? Stop, Francis, buddy. Re That's not a flippant sentence I just throw out there. Every day I examine my heart, my motive. What was the reason I said it? Why did I do that? When the Bible says God will judge us on the thoughts and the intents of the heart, it's more than lip service. What is your motive? What is my motive? And again, I'm not thinking of you. I, get to, I have to hear this message three times. This is my punishment, okay? <laughs> I, I, I've got to examine my own heart. 
And it just, how did I even get the message? Because I've been marinating this reality of the week before the crucifixion. Where were these guys? Were these guys going, yeah, man, it's awesome. We're taking over. And they were about to get cremated. Their thoughts were bizarre. And yet there was a wake-up call coming that was better than all the unreality they were thinking. And that was that, that dependency upon God would get so deep in them that after they recognized they were wrong and Jesus appeared to them and received them and loved them, did not push them away. He knew what they would do. He understood they would all mess up, but his plan was better. That in their weakness, in that upper room, and I, that's, I'm telling you, the video I want to check out is that upper room where they spent 10 days there. And they weren't just, hallelujah, hallelujah, praise the Lord, brother, amen, amen, amen. No, they were, they got down in the dirt. They, they, had, they couldn't sit next to each other without saying, you know, I was an idiot. When I was telling you that I was going to be on this right hand, when I was thinking of myself as more significant than you, I am sorry for that. I was wrong. Would you forgive me? Now let's praise the Lord. They weren't just jumping in there like, it's all good, all good, it's over, he died, it's all good, let's keep, la, la, la. No, they were not doing the religious deal. And when it came time, when the Spirit of God moved, after 10 days of soaking in that, and they realized it's time to leave the room, boys, because the Spirit of God's about to fall. Peter goes, I'm not going by myself, I will not go. I, no longer a solo flight, no longer Francis thinks he knows what's best. If you guys don't go with me, I can't go. And someone yells, I'm smart, I guess. No, anyway, so <laughs> then someone says, I'll go with you, and I'll go with you. I'll go with you too, and I'll go with you too. And all of a sudden, in heaven, they're having high fives. They're thinking, yeah, the fam's come together. Now, finally, we're getting what I always intended for them to be one. For them to understand that my spirit's going to guide them into family and they're going to see more things done when they recognize what they're not and receive who they really are. So number three, deception is more deceiving than you realize. It is. I accept it. That's why Paul said this. Now these things happen to them in 1 Corinthians as an example and a warning to us. All the things we read about in the word of God. They were written for our instruction to admonish and equip us upon whom the ends of the ages has come. Therefore, let no one who thinks he stands firm, which means immune to temptation, being confident and self-righteous, take care that he does not fall into sin and condemnation. You know, I, I know I'm a very intense guy, and my wife is grateful she's not. But I think about finishing every aspect of my life well. I've got only 30 or 40 more good years. I've got, a, I, I've got a season ahead that I want to fulfill the destiny of God in my life. And so I take it very seriously every day. Number four, Jesus is the one you're looking for. If we refuse to submit to his lordship, no one else is coming. Heaven sent one person. Even in the world, I recognize that all religions could not blend. And that when I understood that only Christianity said that God came to earth, experienced every temptation that we have ever experienced, but never submitted to those things, and then because of his love was willing to take on himself the punishment that we deserve and to give his life for us, that was his heart. The God of love is desperately involved in wanting to rescue every one of us. And so he doesn't want me to dwell on what I'm not. He wants me to dwell on who I really am. In heaven, we're not going to spend a second talking about our sins. We're not going to go, and now we're going to look at Brandon's life. Oh, we're going to get into the gory details of what Brandon did. No, we're not going to spend a second talking about what we're not. We will spend eternity rejoicing 
in the fact that God covered our sin, forgave us. Now, I'm not saying we're not going to know the battles and the struggles we've gone through. I believe we'll be epistles, not just here, but then we will be known even as we are known. I believe we'll be able to look at each other and somehow, in a, in a purified way, understand the essence of the struggle in each other's lives. None of the gory details, I don't need that, but we're going to know the battles, the struggles, the things we went through. That Our testimony will not be gone. We're not going to be vaporized and have amnesia forever, no. We will understand in its purest form how God has rescued us, and then we'll talk about that, the rescue mission of what God did, not the foolishness that we did. And that's why the Bible says, 2 Corinthians, he made Christ, who knew no sin, to judicially be sin on behalf, on our behalf, so that in him, in Jesus, we would become the righteousness of God, that is, we would be made acceptable to him and placed in a right relationship with him by his gracious, loving kindness. I was thinking the other day about what selfishness is. Selfishness is basically me doing what I really want to do. I just want to do that. And so it's it, in this self-absorbed culture where everyone thinks it's their right to do what I want to do, where we have no responsibility before a holy God. And if I'm not hurting you directly, I can do whatever I want. And frankly, a lot of the stuff we do in the airwaves hurts a lot of people. And yet we still tout that right. And yet I, I believe that with all the selfishness in our lives, God's love and God's forgiveness and God's covering is greater. Number five, Jesus is more forgiving than you can ever imagine. And so we'll be processing. And, and even as I get older now, even though um, I, I remember it said to me as a young man that reading through the, the prophets, the minor prophets, um, initially you'll think there's a lot of judgment there. But then someone said, the more you read them, there's a lot of mercy there. And that's really what I've seen in my relationship with God. I just see more mercy because I'm receiving more mercy. I, I, I see more the pit he dug me out of. I see more the attitudes he covers, the forgiveness he offers my life. That's why Psalm 103 says this, he has removed our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. And that's infinity. We are completely separated from our sins. So when I think of Easter, I am rejoicing. First of all, I don't have to minimize what I've done in order to feel better about who I am. I want to be able to accept that everything I did has been completely covered and forgiven by a loving, caring God. That only makes me more appreciative. He was forgiven much, loves much. I want to recognize, and, and therefore, no matter what background, again, my daughters would say they had a great upbringing. And so they did not have to experience some of the things. My wife had a, she would say, a better upbringing than I had. I agree. But they do, and I do, need to appreciate that my sin separates me from God. One story I'm going to close with is a Caleb spot. I met years ago in, in Australia a missionary. And, and the funny thing about meeting him initially is he had a very quirky personality. He was not a guy that you'd be drawn to. He had no social skills in Western culture. But then I heard he was an amazing guy. And then I wrote his story in a Caleb spot. A missionary I once met had spent years ministering to a remote tribe, actually in New Guinea, without seeing any converts. One day, a member of the tribe accidentally electrocuted the missionary's nine-year-old son. The tribe had a custom that when someone was killed, the victim's relatives had the right to take revenge. They expected the missionary to take the life of the one who took his son's life. But instead of exacting retribution, the missionary forgave him. This response sent a shockwave through the tribe. They had never heard of anyone forgiving such a deed. Eventually, because of he and his wife's selfless attitude, the entire tribe came to know Jesus. His family had experienced an incomprehensible loss, but their willingness to forgive changed everything. 
forgive those who have hurt you, you'll be amazed at the difference it makes. I'd like the prayer team to come. We're just going to pray, and we're just going to examine our hearts. I want you to consider um, your life and just, if you want to close your eyes for a moment, just reflect on who you are. You've heard a lot of things today. What did you gravitate toward? Was it easy for you to accept that in your life you've been very wrong? Is it easy even now for you to acknowledge areas in your life where there are still adjustments that are needed? Where in your life are you following the crowd where it's just easier just to go along rather than be different, be the person God's called you to be? What areas do we even acknowledge now are deception that you know are not right? And yet, you need God's help to be transformed. Do you really believe that Jesus is the one you need even now? That he's the one that your heart longs for? The only one who will love you unconditionally, who will forgive you completely, who will heal every part of your life? Will you fully receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior today? Today, do you realize that you need his forgiveness? and that you perhaps need to forgive someone else who hurt you. All of us get hurt by people. That's the universal condition. But are you willing to forgive others that you might be forgiven as well? If any of those things apply to you in the room, any of those things you're going, that's me. I'd like some movement in the spirit, some acknowledgement. I'm not going to have you come forward, but some acknowledgement. I heard what the Word of God was saying today and I'm going to apply it to my life. If any of the things that we spoke about today really spoke to you, would you stand to your feet right now? And we're going to pray. Father God, we thank you that we need the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus today. We need you dying for our sins, overcoming every temptation, being victorious where we could not be. We need you rising from the dead, conquering sin and death, and then sending your Holy Spirit to live in us that we would be more than conquerors ourselves. Lord, we thank you that you're not a God of shame and guilt and condemnation. You're a God of love and forgiveness and acceptance. But we have to acknowledge our need. We have to acknowledge reality before we can receive reality. And so we thank you for your presence in this place today, Lord. We sang about it. We heard about it. And now we want to respond to your spirit. And so we're going to pray together. And and this prayer is going to be, I believe, an overview of what was shared today. But I'd like you to pray it out loud on this Easter Sunday. Let it be a proclamation, a declaration of your conviction in your heart. And then if you need more prayer, there's folks here at the front. If you need help, if you need healing, if you need hope, just come out of your seat at the end, and they'll be happy to pray with you. So would you join me in praying out loud this prayer? Heavenly Father, I thank you for your great love for me. When you think about me, you smile. You love me. Not everything I've done but everything I am to you. You see past my faults. You covered my sin with the blood of your son. And I receive that today. Your complete forgiveness. I humble myself before you. Make that a part of my life every day to acknowledge my need for you that I need you to be my Savior. I need you to be the Lord of my life, the God of my life in every area. I repent of my sins, and I want to follow you and live for you all the days of my life in the name and the authority of Jesus Christ. Amen. Give God a hand. Amen.